did. Thank you. Excellent point. <laughs> um, and just for everybody in this in this gather here today, please understand that this is our first time presenting. So we're excited and nervous. And so we're going to beg your forgiveness right at the beginning. <laughs> so you can help us fill in the gaps and and contribute where where you see the need. All right, so my name is Andrea Pritchett. Again, I've been cop watching. I'm a, I'm an eighth grade middle school teacher right now, but um, I've been cop watching. I helped to start Berkeley Cop Watch in 1990. And, and I've been continuously involved for all that time. So I've kind of had the opportunity to go from analog to digital, if you know what I mean. Um, so um, yeah, I guess that's all I see. And I'd like to introduce Stephanie. Um, Stephanie, why don't you go ahead and, and talk about what you do with CopWatch and your situation. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Moore. I've been a CopWatch volunteer since just after the Black Lives Matter first set of protests in 2015. Um, I work in uh, at a legal aid organization for homeless people here in Berkeley. And um, yeah, I'm so excited that you guys are all here and that we can present this tool to you uh, during this moment. And go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> can you explain well, that's, that? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hi everyone, um, my name is Yvonne Ng. Um, I work at Witness where I manage the archives program um, and I help build this database um, with Berkeley Cop Watch. Um, in case you're not familiar, um, Witness is an international nonprofit human rights organization um, that supports people to use video and te technology to protect and defend human rights. Um, we're really proud to have taken part um, in this collaboration with Berkeley Cop Watch for the past um, few years, a couple of years. Um, and just to mention that this project grew out of other collaborations we've been doing with um, other cop watch organizations throughout the country. And most notably, I uh, also want to acknowledge um, Dennis, uh, Dennis Flores from El Grito de Sunset Park in Brooklyn um, for their guidance and partnership on another project that we did called um, Profiling the Police um, with El Grito, um, which served as a really important foundation um, for this project that we're sharing today. Um, I also want to take this moment to acknowledge um, a community archives consultant, Robin Margolis, who worked with us on this project and actually also worked with Berkeley Cop Watch preceding, you know, our relationship with them um, to support their archiving efforts. Um, and finally, I also want to acknowledge my colleague, um, Zaki, Jackie Zamudo, who can't be um, with us today because she's taking care of a little brand new human, um, but we really miss her and uh, she and she managed this project um, on the witness side for us. Yeah. So uh, for those who are just joining us, welcome. And um, just to let you know, so what, are, what we're hoping to do today is to share some of what we learned in our process of, of trying to create, trying to improve our ability to use information strategically. That's really what the goal was. It wasn't to build a database. It was to empower our information. Um, and another goal is to just have folks understand that um, just what, what, what kinds of conversations we were having, what sort of things we were thinking about as we worked together to create this tool. Um, <clears throat> I've been sort of framing, framing this, this empowering of our CopWatch information as a three-step process. Um, you know, one has to do with the actual evidence that we gather curation or the way that we organize our information, and then campaigns, what we do with the information, hopefully if it's well organized. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're actually going to show you these tools um, in a little more depth um, with the hope that if you decide, yeah, this is what we want to do, the reason why we're here today is because we want to help you get there. And so this is not the only time you're going to see us today. We're hopeful that you will, you will hit us back and say, you know what, Andrea, or you know what, Yvonne, Stephanie, we want to do this. We got some questions, we got some obstacles, but we want to help you get through that. Because um, it, it's one struggle. It's one struggle. Go ahead. 
And of course, yeah, feedback and a survey and such. So what was happening for us at Copwatch, for at Berkeley Copwatch, and maybe this is true for you in some measure. We had bought, we, you know, <laughs> we started in 1990, so we had literally boxes of footage of VHS day, high, high A, mini DVD, all these different formats. Then we entered the digital age. And so we had all this information that we weren't really using. You know, we kind of, when we cop watched, we would sort of wait, like if there was some really egregious thing that we witnessed, we could go ahead and, and publicize that and use it to discredit the police and so forth. But we weren't taking advantage of all the little, all the information that we were seeing and the, the information that we were holding and learning about a particular office. Yeah, that officer is bad or this, you know, they keep doing this or that. So what we, 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 we wanted to make better use of the footage that we were collecting. We had, you know, our style of cop watching started in 1990 and we sort of thought of it as like we were resisting police misconduct in the streets. And that, you know, we were like, yeah, get a crowd together and, um, and really challenge the police officers and so forth. And while it's helpful, while it was, it was helpful to have videos of people resisting injustice, that's good. But sometimes we needed to be able to just take evidence into courtrooms. And sometimes that footage didn't hold up in, in a courtroom situation. We also realized that, that on the one hand, again, it's good to take a resistance strategy and, and this kind of thing, but we weren't able to really participate in policy discussions or we weren't able to use our footage to show the rest of the world what we were seeing. Um, so that was a problem of organization of our stuff. Um, and then, it, I don't know if this ever happened to you, but, but there have been points where you know, I, I teach middle school and I, and I even had a high school, you know, and, and kids that come to me and they go, oh, Ms. Pritchard, I got this on video. Nah, nah. But if we don't do anything with the footage, if we, you know, we scan and go, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing too big here. Oh yeah, well, just hang on to it or delete it, whatever. And yet there's valuable information in that. So by, by figuring out ways to, to, to gather information together, to aggregate it and be able to analyze it, it re-motivates our cop watching efforts. It means it turns everybody into like doing doing surveillance for the people, you know what I mean? Um, so uh, why don't you go ahead? So what we what, what we started to realize is that there there actually were some pretty specific different ways that we could use our footage. For example, there were times there have been times where uh, we took evidence and it was used in somebody's probation hearing. That's a positive, to, to, to use the footage to show that somebody was not guilty of what they were accused of. That's helpful. To use information in civil cases, that's also like that's, or, or in complaints, you, you folks like to file complaints against the police. But it's also true that when we see patterns, when we can take lots of this footage that we're seeing and put it together, it can demonstrate how police practices are impacting our community. We also realized that sometimes particular officers were really showing up over and over and over again in our footage, but without a way to bring it all together, you know, that this cop watcher over on the, this side of town has some, and this one has some, and, and it's, all, it's, all, it's all diffused. And it's also like when we want to, even when we want to make propaganda or make videos about particular topics, again, if we can call that information together, <laughs> we realized that we were, you know, you could make a hundred documentaries based on like just the footage that we had collected, but, but you couldn't because it wasn't organized. Next slide. So, so we got this idea that we did want to figure out a way of organizing. And, and at first we were, you know, I was thinking of like, oh, a national database and how, blah, 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 blah. And then, and then we, we began having conversations with, with folks from Witness and Yvonne asked me this very profound question. She said, okay, we're going to get started. How we do this? 
She said, well, what do you want to ask your data? What do you want to know? And I realized that by us having to ask that question, it meant that as an organization, we kind of had to identify our, our priorities. And, and it's kind of like a laser light, and it was making us have to focus. So the areas that we were focused, we decided, you know, it's like, well, how do Berkeley police respond to mental health calls? And there's a lot of talk right now about defunding police and getting them out of mental health calls. We really, you know, so that was, so if, again, if we can show, well, what are we seeing out in the streets? How are Berkeley police racially profiling? We have a terrible situation in Berkeley, as does everybody, about the, the racial disparities in policing. So what does that look like? The other one was which officers, and I think we all have this question, which officers are the most dangerous to our community? So again, now that question, I'm hopeful that as I'm talking, you're thinking about your own situation. And, and I recognize that it's different for all of us, or it could well be, maybe it's not. <laughs> we'll see, wait till the survey comes out. <laughs> Feel free to chat, go ahead, good next slide please. So uh, I have to confess that my strength is not in technology. And that, that has been a strength and a weakness at times. But what's great is that um, by having people with a lot of technological savvy and, and, and know-how like, like Yvonne and, and Stephanie and stuff, folks who really know a lot and, and to continue the conversation with people who are cop watching and to develop the database that's closely aligned with how we do what we do has been a, a real high priority in the design of this database. But it took me a while to understand what we were doing. <laughs> so I wanted to highlight just some of you, this is easy and just some of you, maybe this is helpful. I had to realize that, that a database, an archive and a template were, were different things. So the database is, is the actual information itself that we're gathering. Um, it's the collection of information um, that can be accessed, managed, updated, that it's the actual information. So our database keeps track of footage, but it's also searchable by incident, by officer, we can add documents to it, we can have it relate to video, etc. cetera. Um, the archive is our collection of footage, which we keep on a hard drive. Um, so that's kind of separate from the database itself. Um, but the database organizes, it helps us to locate the footage quickly and associate it with a document in the database. What we have released publicly and what we're offering to anybody who wants it is a template of our database and the way that we organize our information. And what's crucial to realize is that you can, you can have it, you can customize it to meet your situation and help you organize what you encounter. Um, so the template that we have and what we, we decided ultimately, we started out in 1993 with a FileMaker Pro um, kind of template that was given to us from the Center for Third World Organizing. And it was very basic. Um, and it didn't, it didn't meet our needs. It didn't, technology outpaced kind of the design of that thing and, and it no longer was useful to us. So our data, our, our data organizing fell apart. So we're hopeful that the template that is now available to you um, does, does account for the way we use technology today. Um, next slide, please. So we met together with folks from Witness, I guess it was two years ago, is it two years ago? <laughs> and, um, and some of the things that we did were, um, in the, uh, was trying to make sure that in the design of this template, that, that we said, well, we have to account for the fact that we're not going to have 
a hired office manager who's going to be handling all this data. You know, we're not going to be paying somebody. We're not going to have consistency in who's there. We're dependent upon volunteers. So we have to make it accessible and understand that there's going to be a, a variety of familiarity with FileMaker Pro or databases in general or, you know, so it, we have to just really keep access at the front of our minds um, as, we, as we move through and understand, again, that we're trying to make something that's adaptable to different uh, geographies and different socioeconomic situations, demographics, cultural uh, traditions, and so forth. Um, so we tried to, tried to keep those questions, those issues in our mind. We also designed this with the idea of like, well, you know, understand that it may cost some money to get started, but, but it was really important to us to keep it as accessible economically as we could, keep it low budget. Can I shout out uh, Dan's question, uh, Dan from what? Portland Cup Watch? Um, and Yvonne, you might want to take this one. Uh, Dan is asking, are there open source analogs to FileMaker? Yeah, sorry, I just couldn't unmute myself. Um, uh, there's, there isn't an open source tool exactly like FileMaker that I know of. Um, I mean, there are, um, there, there, there are um, open source tools to create databases, but I, they're a bit um, more, um, you know, difficult to set up and use, I would say. Um, there are a couple of other like non-open source but free alternatives to FileMaker, which we'll point out, um, such as like Airtable. Um, you know, there's there's paid and free versions of that, or even and you can also use spreadsheets, so like Google Sheets or Excel, which are not open source or free, but um, maybe more widely accessible than than FileMaker. Great. Um, by the way, I also want to notice Richard Boland's question. Or just his statement that you've got tons and tons of video. Yeah, just like us. Um, and didn't have a way to index it. I think, um, I think as we go through this presentation, Richard, I think uh, maybe they'll, it'll, it'll relate exactly to that. Um, and Jocelyn says that we're researching and evaluating more OS options. We can share them out after the evaluation. Wonderful. Oh, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is in, in our design assumptions was that we we're trying to figure out how to deal with security. And, and I know you guys, many of you already know these things, but um, I, I was very resistant to databases that say, give, give us your information, we'll handle it for you. Because we're very interested in, in, in local um, because we want to give support to people. We don't just want people's information. Like that's not, for us, that's not what it's about. It's about empowering the cop watching with action, with follow-up. Um, collecting videos, like people, people, <laughs> kids would say to me, okay, so you watch them beat me up, now what? You know, and, and so yeah, you know, we have to empower that cop watching with, with protest or some kind of something. But, but other issues in terms of, of not having it be online, um, there's an organization called Open Oversight that was trying to create officer profiles on cops in Chicago. And they opened it up and said, hey, people, if you know stuff about cops, you know, upload it, you know, and here's how you do that. And, and it's kind of a hands-off thing. The officers decided to just flood their database with bad information. And so it really diminished the credibility of what, you know, and made it, and that's a, that's a large police, thousands of officers. So we had that in our mind. We also understand that we want to keep our people who, who come to us with information, it's really important to respect their confidentiality and to make sure that, you know, we, we account for things like, mm, we don't want to get subpoenaed. We don't want to advertise our information in various ways. We, we don't want this information released unless we have explicit permission from that person to do so. So that was on our minds. Um, it's limiting right now when we do 
when we do intake, we do it in person at the, at the, in the, we have an office and we go to the office and go to that computer and that's where we do the intake. We're, we're looking at options for maybe doing tablets or so forth, but I don't think we're gonna throw the whole thing open and just tell people to, to put information in there. We really wanna monitor that information and respond to people um, and build relationship in that way. You know, it's important to us not to make a victim tell their story over and over again, unless we're actually gonna take action. You know, um, so uh, go ahead. So uh, what I really appreciated about the process that we used to develop this, what, what this photo is a photo of the actual charts that we created when Yvonne was saying, well, what do you ask them and how does it, how does an interview go and what information are you tracking and so they paid attention to the way we do our cop watching. We have shifts that go out. We, we um, pick times each week and we drive or walk on these shifts. And when we come back, we have, we have little forms to call incident reports that we fill out. And so they paid a lot of attention to the way we actually do things. Not, not necessarily, you know, not necessarily the way we wish we did things, but the way we do do things. And, um, and it accounts for things like you go out on a cop watch shift and you come back and you're really tired or you're traumatized or something like that. You don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time doing intake. So they, I, I just appreciate that they accounted for a lot of stuff. Um, next one. Other things that we were thinking about was again, this, this notion that we want to control our own data. So again, a lot of people have come to me like, Andrew, aren't you happy that there's, they're talking about national databases? I have two, I have probably 40 or 50 examples of national databases that have been created by various individuals. What we're prioritizing is group efforts, organizations in relationship to their community. Um, Trusted community can use the template to make their own database. So we people have called us from like really tiny towns in Northern California and said like the cops are harassing us and no 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 what can we do? And and I believe that information is power. And so now I feel good. Like if it, I don't you know maybe it's a Baptist church or maybe it's a you know community organization or or something they decide they want to, they can take a copy of that template and become the local curator, the local repository for that information. And that can become the basis for an organizing effort in that, in that town or city. Um, number three, impacted people can have their stories corroborated and be connected to each other for organizing and action. So a lot of times when our rights are violated by police, there may not be anybody around, there may not be a witness. There may not even be video, but yet if we collect those stories, we can corroborate each other's accounts. And so while we may not be able to take action on this incident alone, if we can get victim, some victim survivors and witnesses and people together, impacted people work together, it becomes a much more powerful um, uh, pushback. The other thing that I really like about this database idea is that, is that it's community-based research. And again, it can engage all kinds of people, very young people and very old people. And, and what happens over time with this database thing is that, is that profiles of cops start to emerge um, and, and, and the impact, how, how the laws of the, of the city or the policies of the police are actually impacting us. And again, it can be seen, not, not in one or two incidents, but over time. Go ahead, next. So by making a decision to say, we want to get more organized and get more focused and stuff, we realized that that, that has ramifications for how we engage on the street in, in incidents. Um, 
you know, I have been known to say, <laughs> I'm going to say to cuss at police and to be really angry and to shout at them. And I realized that I went to a conference with Robin and, and um, I thought I, I was showing them some footage that I thought showed the cops acting really poorly. And then some woman raised her hand. And she goes, well, what do you do with contaminated evidence? And I was like, what? I had no idea what she was talking about. I didn't realize that my yelling, I thought I was righteously yelling, um, but apparently that bias is a jury against what they're seeing. And so it made me have to think about what, what am I trying to do when I'm at that point of engagement with the police? Um, curation. So let's imagine that I actually got some information at the point of contact. Now I come back to the office, how we organize it. So that had to change within Berkeley Cop Watch. And then, and then the, the third thing is, is campaigns. What can I do with that curated evidence, that curated information? Now, if it's well organized, I have more options about how to wage a justice campaign. I have more options about how to make it, hmm, how to push back. And so that, that mattered. Go ahead, next. So fortunately, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, uh, Witness had something called the video as evidence guide. And what this, what this, this is a page out of that guide. And what it's showing us here is that at the very, very top of this kind of escalating ladder of, of evidence, of information, you know, at the bottom it says, it says commission of a crime. Like maybe my, maybe I am yelling. Maybe that, maybe, maybe my footage is rough. Maybe I took pictures of my feet running away from the cops. You know, even as rough as it is, it can still be useful. But it might be more useful if I remember to say the date and the time, if I remember to get some locators of where the incident happened, if I, you know, if I didn't say F you pig, you know, if I kind of just held my, held my editorial opinion and, and instead kind of focused on what was happening in the interaction there. There's a range of evidence collection. And so trial ready is the highest standard of evidence, but it's not to say that, that the, other, the other information we get isn't useful, but it is important to think about how we want to use that. You know, at the moment when we're on the street right there. Um, next slide. So yeah, as, as cop watch, Go ahead. Was somebody going to say something? Um, so we we did. We actually got a study group together. That video is evidence. That's a link right there. And we'll provide this PowerPoint to you um, and the resources to you. But that that uh, workbook, we we did a four four or five week study group where we got people together. And we read a few pages. Like, well, what does that mean? Well, how's that going to impact our cop watching? How's that going to impact the way we gather information? And so it made, you know, we weren't trying to completely redesign our cop watch, but we were saying, are there little fixes, little things that we could do to raise the quality of what we do? Um, so the, the, the thought bubble question is, is trial-ready evidence a desirable and reasonable standard for our, our documentation efforts? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes we can't do that, but sometimes maybe we can. Um, and just, I don't know, you know, I, I'm interested to hear how, how you all kind of manage your, your cop watching shifts. We work a lot with students from UC Berkeley and we have to, um, uh, what can I say, just kind of standardize some of our processes. What, this is a, a photo of, a, we call it a cop watch incident report form, but what it does is it helps our volunteers to know what to look for when they're observing the police. So yeah, getting the badge number, getting the, the you know the address, the time, the date, who was there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so some of the ways that we at Cop Watch get information 
is from our cop watch shifts that we planned and we've organized and we take people out. Sometimes I'm just walking around town on my own and I'll see something and I'll, I'll videotape it. Sometimes people contact us over email and they just say like, here's a video somebody sent to me and blah, blah, blah. So there's different ways that we're getting information. Um, and so we begin with offloading the video and then, and then what, what Stephanie is going to walk you through and Stephanie and, and Yvonne are going to show you is kind of that process, what you do at that point of intake. Um, and so sometimes there will be a written record. Sometimes that's all you have. Sometimes all you have is the footage. And so we're trying to, to um, tease out information like, well, did, did, you, did you get the witness's name? Or what is the name of the person who took the footage? Because if it was going to go to court and you had to testify, you know, that might not come up for a couple of years. So, um, so this is this is another thing to consider. Um, next slide, please. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie and Yvonne. Um, but before I do that, does anybody want to? Does anybody want to uh, comment or? Um, have questions about that that particular part of things? I stop screen sharing. Would that be helpful? Yeah. Anybody is there reactions, thoughts, comments? Please feel free. I think this is great. Uh, interested to see what form the templates for FileMaker are in because probably I, I would probably do this on an Amazon database uh, as a MySQL database or a MariaDB database but seeing what it'll take to convert the format set up the database and start putting our data in our version of it. Oh, cool. I'm interested to hear what, what you guys are using. Is that a direct I, I, yeah. oh, Andrea, this is Dan. I, I was just wondering uh, when you use something like Amazon or Google or some other nasty corporation that likes to mine your data, um, is that really a secure way to do it? I mean, is it better to keep it on your own hard drive? I mean, that's, that's what we're doing. I think it's it's definitely a question to consider. Like um, a lot of those products might be a, a cheaper, and they might be more accessible because you can, you know, the the interface is really easy to use, or you can access it from multiple um, different computers or iPhones or whatever because they're um, online. So I think thinking about, you know, it. Could your information be shared with the feds? How accessible do you want the, the evidence to be? Um, these are all questions you should kind of think about for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also like the, the tech support and tech capacity of your own organization is a big consideration. Like don't choose any technology that you can't maintain you know, or you, yeah, you don't have the volunteers who have that technology to maintain. Great. Well, um, anybody else feel free to shout out your question or put it in the chat. Um, and uh, we'll turn it over. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, Yvonne, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, so curation is a word that we've been throwing around a little bit. Um, and, and curation really refers to the organization of the database and archive. So there are practices that we come to agreement on what footage to include or exclude, how we organize the footage, and how we are maintaining our archive of footage. So some examples of these is there information that we don't accept? So we made the choice that, um, you know, we don't have the capacity be, to be taking on footage and evidence from cop, 
or from encounters all over the country, we want to really focus on our local situation. So in those kind of instances, we don't know those other departments, we don't know the local situation, and we'll just uh, try to connect those people to people working on the ground where they are. Another example is what are our storage practices? So we're backing up our, our footage, we're backing up, we have a backup copy. So we download all of our footage to our external hard drive and then we have an offsite backup where um, if there's natural disaster, you know, if uh, there's a break in in the office, we, we still have that precious information that people are trusting us with. Um, curation can also be the labels or tags that we assign to evidence. And this, this is important for being able to search for your evidence. So what are the kinds of things that you are trying to track with your evidence? Um, so we decided specifically we're interested in certain types of use of force. So, you know, are kettles being used? Are certain types of less lethals being used? Questions like that. Um, we're also tracking broader issues, like Andrea mentioned earlier, mental health in Berkeley and how the police interact with people in mental health crisis, um, homeless issues, racial profiling, so on. Um, curation can also be the ways that we can retrieve the information. So what, uh, who has access to the database? Who has access to the footage and what permissions might you have when you log into the database. So we have a guest mode where you can access the database and just, you can't enter information, but you can look through and, and research and certain things are blurred out like con contact information. Um, so uh, we can protect people's identities in that way. Yvonne, if you wanna go to the next slide. So when you're thinking through the specific issues in your local area, um, these are some, some big ones that came up for us that you might wanna consider. So again, what are your retention policies? What type of information and evidence are you, are you um, collecting and deciding not to collect? Um, an example of this is we decided that we wanted to collect routine incidents where it's not necessarily um, an instance of police brutality as such, but we want to see ongoing patterns and practices with uh, the departments and, and try to look at those incidences over time. Um, we were also thinking about confidentiality issues. So protecting the identities of people who are giving us their footage, who are, who are witnesses or who experience police violence, um, and, and also protecting the footage. So when are we blurring the faces uh, when we release the footage? Questions like that. Um, we wanna consider when to go public. So um, one example of this is, Andrew was talking about trial ready evidence. So in, in a trial, when you know your footage is going to a legal case, maybe you don't want to release it. Maybe you want to uh, catch the cops in a lie in the courtroom. Or maybe you want to try them in the court of public opinion and you release that broadly on social media, to the media, whatever. So these are choices that you have to think about. We also were thinking about response to subpoenas. Um, I think Andrea mentioned this earlier too. So, you know, in the case where someone might be giving us footage that could be subpoenaed, we want to hand that off to a lawyer and not hold on to it because we don't want to risk having to give that information over. You can think of security issues, um, simply the security of your physical space where you're keeping the footage, and then you know the kinds of questions about online or a hard drive that we've been talking about. So um, is it hackable? Are they going to share your information with the feds, the whatever corporation is hosting your data? Um, and then we were really thinking about how to respond in a timely manner, manner to incidents that happen and media inquiries. Um, 
I'm sure all of you have just footage everywhere, just taking up space on your phone. So how do we find it quickly when we need to respond to a media deadline or some something like that and be able to hand that off? Yvonne, you can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm sure on your mind is what do you need to build your own database? Um, we obviously took, a, we decided on our own model, but these are kind of the basics that you need for building a database. So you're probably going to need a computer that can handle footage. It can handle viewing footage, moving footage around, uploading, offloading footage. So it needs enough RAM to be able to do that. You're gonna to need to think about where you're storing your footage. So you need maybe an external hard drive or a cloud drive. And you can think of a cloud drive like a Google Drive or a Dropbox um, and, and the type of concerns that come, come with each of those. Um, for both of those, you're gonna to wanna to consider an offsite backup of your data. So what we do is we put everything on our hard drive and then download it to another hard drive that we keep offsite so that if something happens to the hard drive, we have another one that, you know, so we can hold on to that precious information. And with a cloud drive, you might wanna consider that too because, you know, a company can decide to stop hosting your data. And so you wanna have control of that in case that does happen. You're gonna want a program or a web app to be able to enter the data associated with your footage. Um, so we chose FileMaker Pro, but um, you know, as has been mentioned, you could be using simply a spreadsheet where you're entering you know, time, date, location, officers at the incident, and then a link or something that or a cataloging system that points you to your footage. Um, you know, uh, there's a whole range of options and it sounds like some of you are already exploring this. So I'm totally interested to know what you guys are thinking about and choosing. Um, but I will say that, that the program or application that you choose does affect, um, you know, the user experience the design, how easy it is to use, how customizable it is, and the types of questions you can ask of your footage. So what types of searches you can perform. Um, you're also gonna wanna think about standardizing practices for inputting data. So agreeing on you know, uh, practices for how you're uploading your footage and how you're tagging it, um, how you enter, something even as simple as how you enter a date into the field? Are you entering it numerically? Or are you writing out January? And that's all so you can search it later. Um, you might think about standardizing the terminology you're using. We're all using, you know, all kinds of lingo to talk about uh, the cops. So you want to be able to come to agreement on how you're talking about these things so you can search them later. And you might want to come up with a, just a user guide for how are you using your database? How do you perform a find? How do you input data? And um, you'll probably want someone who can troubleshoot the tech issues that come up. So like Avon was saying, if you don't have the tech, technological capacity, you might want to go with a simple spreadsheet. Um, so think about what you're able to do. Um, you can go to the next slide. So now um, Yvonne is going to show us the database from her computer and feel free to jump in Yvonne with anything you want to say. Um, but we're just going to show you what, what we built and you can try to think about, you know, how it's useful to you. Um, we could spend a ton of time talking about each individual decision we made and, and why we chose to collect the information that we chose, but uh, we just want to kind of run through it and show you what there is so you can think about the possibilities for what you want to do. And FileMaker is super customizable. So, um, you know, all these buttons and fields can be adapted for your situation. So this is the screen you come to when you log in to our database. This is the home screen. 
And you can see at the top, there's a search field. So we're, we're searching incident narratives, officers, multimedia, documents, legal cases, and participants. So by participants, we're talking about witnesses, cop watchers, um, people who were impacted, arrested, detained, what have you. And then you can see at the bottom here are the different ways that, that we can input our data. So if we wanted to go create an incident, and, and an incident is kind of the level of information that we're interested in uh, because we're taking footage of individual incidents. Um, so that's why we made that choice. But you can see kind of an overview of the types of information we're collecting. And all of these fields are searchable. So, um, you know, you can think about how you can perform fines based on the individual fields. Like, oh, what were the incidents involving a, a certain officer? Or what were, what happened? Let's say like, for example, if we scroll all the way to the top, um, we are trying to find footage from a date and like, you know, this is just a simple way to organize your footage. So let's say um, we wanted to find footage from May 13th, 2019. And Yvonne went into find mode. And then at the top, we'll click perform find, yeah. And so you can see that there's um, three incidents associated with this date. And so you can scroll through and see the other data that we put in for these incidents and try to find the one that we want to find. So this one, um, you can see the officers, if you go up Yvonne, the officers identified at the incident. Um, we can see the location was People's Park. Um, you could enter what which agencies were at incident. So many times we have multiple agencies at the same incident. Um, you can look at the participants identified at incident. So here we've redacted the names of people just so that because we're recording and you know we're we're not sure that they want to share this information, we redacted it for the training. But you can see that there were two subjects here, and by subject we mean the person who was at the center of the police encounter who is being arrested or detained, and a, a witness or documenter. Um, and if you keep scrolling, um, here we have the description of the incident. So you can, you know, select type of stop here. Um, you know, was it a consensual stop. Um, and then we can look at result of stop. So was the person arrested? Were uh, they transported in an ambulance? Um, and then below this is the description narrative. And this is, um, you know, just a narrative description, obviously, of the, what the cop watcher, the witness, or the person who's coming to us with this footage saw or experienced. And, and we try to keep this as factual as possible. Um, we don't want to exaggerate here. We just want to lay out the facts of, of the incident. And if you go all the way to the right, um, I really want to draw your attention to these tags. And we're choosing to tag every incident with the appropriate things that we're trying to track. So if you look at the use of force tags, we were interested in, in tracking these kind of uses of force and how they're being deployed in our streets. So armored vehicles, you know, less lethals, tear gas, um, et cetera. And again, um, we can perform fines of all the incidents where these were present. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But if we wanna look at the incident tags, these are broader um, tags based on different issues that we're tracking in our community. So you can see here, um, 
you know, 5150s, which are involuntary psychiatric holds for people experiencing mental health crises. Um, that's, that's California law. Um, you can see this incident, we were tracking anti-homeless policy and homelessness, like anti-homeless policy because this incident involved a uh, policy we have here in Berkeley about how so much some how much space someone is taking up on the sidewalk. So we're tracking those individual policies, but we also selected homeless here because sometimes it's not a policy, but the cops are just fucking with someone who's homeless. So we want to uh, select those tags so we can come back to them later when we're tracking those issues. Um, and this part is super important. This is the media related to incidents. So this is how we attach the footage to the data. And um, you can think of the file path here as an address that points to the location of your footage, to the home of your footage. And I'll come back to this to show you how it works. Um, but this, this is how the footage attaches to the incident. And if you keep going down, Yvonne, I'll just briefly go through this. This is any follow-up we did on the case. Um, you know, uh, documents we might attach to the incident. So was there a newspaper article written? Was there a legal case um, that came out of this incident? Uh, yeah. So now I want to look at the officers involved at this incident. Um, you can see here there were two that we identified, uh, Sean Aranis and Thomas Wing. And if we go to Sean Aranis's full officer profile, you can see we're tracking officers as well. Um, so here you can see identifying information, name, badge number, department, photos we might have uh, captured of him in uniform with his badge number displayed. Um, and we have a physical description section for if there's an identifying tattoo or something you want to note about the way this person looks. And if you keep scrolling down, Yvonne, um, you, here you can see all the incidents that were associated with this officer, meaning all the incidents we have logged where we have seen and noted that this officer was present. And you can see he has incidents going back to the early 2000s. Um, yeah, he's definitely a problem officer. Um, and then just at the bottom, there's, if you want to take note of anything in the officer's history, that's where you would do that. So we created a report that's kind of like an early warning report for tracking officers. And as you can see this, um, when we sort by all, uh, that didn't work. Oh, show all, there we go. Um, you can see that th this is laid out to track officers by the number of incidents that they've been involved with. So Sean Aranis is at the top. He has more than 30 incidents associated with him. And, and this is a way of, of identifying which officers are showing up the most in your database and which officers might be or become problems in your community. Um, so can we go back to the incident page of on and and we can look at those tags again. Um, so this is how you might like kind of do your research based on all the information that you're inputting. So if you perform a find and let's say you're trying to track um, a use of force. So um, Were we, were we going to try to look at one of these, Yvonne? I think we were going to use uh, racial profiling as an example because we've kind of pre-redacted some records. Right. 
Um, okay, so anyways, you, you could perform a fine based on one of those uses of force, but we redacted stuff related to racial profiling. Um, so these are all the incidents when Yvonne performs the find that um, are where our volunteers or people who are coming to us with footage have tagged it as something that might be racial profiling. And it's very hard to allege that racial profiling did happen. But as we're tagging these incidents, uh, a pattern or certain patterns might begin to emerge over time. So here you can see it's a lot of traffic stops, a lot of release without citation, um, people of color. Um, release without citation is, is important to note because especially when they're being put in handcuffs, um, like this person, uh, you know, why, why are they being handcuffed if they did nothing wrong? And, um, so we can start to track incidents like these. Um, yeah, were we going to do anything else? I think that was it. Um, I think we we're going to switch back to you so you could show how the video connects. In the yeah, audience. okay. So now I'm going to switch to my view because I have all the footage um, on this computer and I'm just going to show you how the footage relates to the incident. Um, so let me share my screen and here is the desktop and where am I? So here is, is an incident that I pulled up, a different incident from that same day and um, so as we scroll down to media related to incident, again, this is the address that points to where your footage is located. So when we open the media files, you can see here, this is how we've chosen to organize our footage on the database. So um, you can see that this is an incident. We've arranged all these folders by date because if we lose our database, we still will have this footage organized by date at least. And then you can see it was taken on Andrea's iPhone. Here are all the videos associated. You can see this, right? Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. <laughs> Just no, no, checking. No. <laughs> um, so you can see that there's videos associated photos associated with the incident. Um, and then I just want to draw your attention to this shift report. And these are records that we can automatically generate from each incident that we input, just so that we can have a record of what this footage shows, just the basic information um, that can be stored with the video in case the data is lost in the database for some reason. Um, does anyone have any questions or, or I think some stuff was happening in the chat, but um, I we wasn't really screen sharing and go back to the whole Oh, Marcus, just go right ahead. Hi, thank you. Is it at all possible to share your uh, database template? Yes. Um, we have the template available on Witnesses' website and Berkeley Cop Watch's website. Um, you do need FileMaker Pro to be able to use it. Um, yeah. Um, but as Stephanie's going to talk about later, you don't, there, we're sharing other resources that will allow you to build your own database without having to rely on FileMaker. Okay, if anyone has anything, just shout it out, whatever. Um, so now going back to the presentation, um, how do I do this? Oh, minimize that. Okay, are you seeing this presentation? Yes. 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 Okay, good. 
Um, so this briefly is the data model that underlies um, our database. And some of you have more familiarity than others. Uh, to me, this has often looked incredibly chaotic. But um, if you want to access our data model and try to you know, import it into whatever other program you're using, you can feel free to look at our data model diagrams um, on the WITNESS website and they're linked here. Um, so when we share out the slides, you'll have that link. Um, Yvonne, you can, oh, I'm screen sharing now. Okay, so I just wanna talk about, yeah, some of the, the documentation that we did and these will be available to you um, if, you, if you find them helpful. But uh, we made this data dictionary and this is rules for how you're entering the data into the database field. So we want to standardize our practices. Um, a great example of this is badge number. So we have five different departments in Berkeley. We have the Berkeley police, the university police, we have the highway patrol, the county sheriffs, we have the BART transit police, and we have mutual aid agreements with all kinds of Bay Area police departments. So um, all of these might have different ways of uh, demarking their badge numbers. There may be different officers with the same badge number at the same time at different departments. There might be, um, you know, officers changing their badge numbers within a department or across departments. So we just wanted to be really clear about how we were entering that into the database so we can track these officers. We also wrote up a controlled vocabulary and, and this is a document with rules where we agreed to the terms that we're using in the database. Um, so again, you wanna be coming to agreements about the types of language that you're using so you can be tracking these things. Um, so a great example of this is the distinction between crowd management and crowd control. So crowd management is the lesser escalated version of you know, protest scenario tactics and strategies that cops are using. So they could be communicating to protest leaders or setting up barricades. Um, and then when that becomes more escalated, we're, we're tracking crowd control strategies and tactics like the use of less lethals, um, kettles, such things. And then um, we created a database user guide. And for us, this is a work in progress. And it's just a guide to how one navigates the database. So if you forget how to perform a search or find, or if you are like, oh, how do I enter an incident? Maybe you're trying to train here. Having a guide written out for how you use it is really important for that. And now I'm gonna hand it back to Andrea, who's gonna talk about how we can use this research and this evidence to create justice campaigns. Sure. And um, just wanted to assure people that, um, that's great, okay. Um, I just wanted to assure people that we are gonna make um, these, we can make these slides available, make a recording available, and um, on the Berkeley Cop Watch web, web page and on the Witness web page, the template, the data dictionary, the control vocabulary are all, are all available. Um, and Jocelyn, will you get the links to this? <clears throat> I'd like to hear more about how you brought in past data. Did you start inputting with new incidents with a dedicated work amount for inputting archive data? Um, yeah. Um, would you like to take that, Yvonne? Sure. So the question is, how did we get the, so the, the old database had quite a number of records, like hundreds of records, um, and it was also built in FileMaker. So that migration process, just in terms of like matching up fields and bringing them in, wasn't that difficult. The challenge was that the structure of the old database was completely different from the new one. It was, a, it, it was essentially just like a flat structure. It was basically just an incident form, whereas the new database had an incident form, but a separate officer's form, a sec separate participant's form. So we had to sort of, 
like pull in the data and make new records. And it, it, took, a, it took a bit of time, but definitely a lot less time than creating hundreds and hundreds of new records. And, um, uh, you know, another thing was that the development process, you know, we've gone, we're on version four of the database now. So, you know, like we would make it, they, they would use it, something isn't working or there's like some data that they want to track and then we would do a new version. And, you know, it was a sort of very iterative process. Yeah, but it did, <clears throat> that was what was really cool is that, that being in such close contact to be able to make those changes was really kept our spirits up. <laughs> um, but then, so then looking at how we use the data. Um, so some of the campaigns we used, go ahead. So I think probably most of us, one of our main considerations is identifying problem officers early. Sadly, we, you know, I wish we did, what can I say? I wish we'd been able to bring all that we knew about this guy together much earlier. Um, he's a dangerous person. Um, but what was happening is once we were using the database and we had all these different, we had homeless people who were taking footage, students were sending it to us and stuff. So very quickly we were like, wow, we had, I don't know, eight or 10, like really explicit, outrageous, video incidents of his of his violence and so we were able we made a <clears throat> what you see here is a example of the posters that we put up on campus that qr code was used to be able so people could put their their cell phone right up there and access the videos of this guy's misconduct right away we wrote letters to the chancellor saying look you have a problem officer you know we need to sit down you know we're advertising and so using publicity exposing this guy and engaging the students, you know, I can't say that we got him fired, but he mysteriously and quickly soon thereafter retired. By putting the video on YouTube with his name, we're hopeful that wherever he goes, his deeds, the records of his deeds will follow. Um, so that's, so I guess, you know, and, and what I really like is the, the ability to, to when, when they were showing you how to do those searches and, and which officers have the highest number of incidents. That's what they call an early warning system. And imagine how awesome it would have been if, if you know, a system like this had, you know, the police are supposed to have a system like this. They're supposed to be identifying their own problem officers, but they don't do that. And that's why we feel like we need to do that. But, but, to, but to create activism around a cop like this, before they kill somebody is sort of the hope. Um, next slide. So, so on the one hand, we want to identify problem officers and, and those are like the spectacular, horrible acts of misconduct. A lot of what we see is just kind of the daily, what can I say, injustice? You know, the, the, the structural racism, the structural classism. Um, we had a situation some in 2013 where uh, a transgender African-American woman who lived with a mental health disability of schizophrenia, she was living on her own in downtown Berkeley and her family knew the police because they had called before to get wellness checks to make sure she's okay and so forth. <clears throat> on this particular night, her friend called the police, said, yeah, I think she's off her meds, blah, blah. The police knew that they knew her name. They had the history. They brought six cops in. They freaked her out. She went back into her apartment, kind of uh, screaming and panicked. They tackled her, put her face down. She's a 300-pound woman. Six officers on top of her. Of course, she stopped breathing. This that case of what happened to Kayla Moore motivated our whole campaign and our whole desire to, uh, what can I say, examine just the why, how are police involved in emergency mental health response? Why are they involved? What is the alternative? What are these practices? You know, we've got, we, we've got them using what they call spit hoods. It's a regular practice of the police to put hoods on people theoretically to keep them from spitting on the cops. It hides the identity of the person. 
it hides the, their ability to identify who they're interacting with. It's horrible. Um, and the use of psychiatric holds, you know, and the misuse of those, you know, and so it's basically, we call it the criminalization of mental health. But what is impactful in this situation is that when we have tagged a bunch of incidents with 5150, and then we can pull them up, I'm able to sit with a commissioner from the mental health commission and say, look, I don't care what the police told you. I don't care what, look, look for yourself. Watch how this goes down. Does this look like care to you? No, of course not. You know, so our ability to influence policy, our ability to identify and, and to talk to our community about how, you know, it didn't just happen to you. This is how they do it. And that's what, that's what we think is, is powerful. That's what's helping us in some of these, especially like in this defund campaign, you know, to be able to, to publicize some of these practices definitely put some, some power behind our, our claims. And um, go ahead, next one. Um, now something like racial profiling, one of the questions we wanted to ask our data was about racial profiling. And we bear in mind that you can't, you know, what can I say? There can be an incident where you, you know that a cop is acting in a racist manner. But then they'd be like, well, gosh, you know, they stopped these kids, these, these, these African-American kids, and they handcuffed them. Um, but is that, is that racial profiling and kind of, racial profiling is something that kind of, you see it over time. You see it, it it's, a, it's a statistic. We in Berkeley know that we have vast disparities in, in how white people are treated by the police, and how people of color are treated by the police. The number of times that they're searched, the number of times that they're arrested, stopped, et cetera. Um, but even still, even though we don't have, we can't create conclusive statistics, again, anecdotally, if I can do a find in my database and get pointed towards all this video where the, where the person, the cop watcher, the person who was doing the intake said, gosh, I wonder if this is racial profiling. Let me tag it. And then when we look at them all together, we go, oh yeah, oh yeah, this same officer is involved every time. Why is he handcuffing kids and then letting them go? You know, and we can begin to, again, get more focused and more precise in our claims and, and, and empowered in our ability to, uh, to press those claims and to prove those claims. Um, all right, um, next slide. So I guess now I'd like to turn it over to you. I'd like to ask you, especially those of you who are part of organizing efforts, how easy or how hard do you think, like would this just totally disrupt the ecology of your, um, of your organization? Do you think, it, you know, do, can you see it working for you or what challenges do you see? What questions do you have? And, um, uh, yeah, so maybe we should go back to gallery view and we can um, maybe engage in a little bit of conversation here. I'd also love to hear your thoughts about how you might, you know, what's worked for you and what, what. <laughs> so uh, we'll just leave the space open. Hey, Andrew, this is Dan again in Portland. Hey, um, yeah, so we started a database. We took some um, lawsuit files that a lawyer shared with us and entered those data, and we started an incident report line around the time when we started up and when we first got trained by you all, mm -hmm. um, where people call in. But uh, along the way, it just became a real drag to type those data into the database. So it just the database mostly morphed into a database of high-profile incidents, especially shootings and deaths in custody. Um, so uh, we do have a database already, but I, I just feel like, you know, I know Berkeley has like one-fifth as many cops as we do. We have like a 1,000 officers here. So I, it feels like a lot of a burden for us to do this for the whole community. And I think like if we do a limited scope, like the cases that we've observed ourselves and the cases that people have called in about and the cases that we read about in the newspaper, 
that's probably enough without us trying to get other people's footage and whatever else is out there. Because it just seems like that's a lot of responsibility for the whole community, and we would end up having to spend most of our time uh, keeping that database up to date, I guess. That's my concern. So can you address that at all? Yeah, I would, I would say, um, I think that's wise, Dan, you know, using this database, you know, it's re rel related to our capacity. For example, in, we have not, we have not broadly, you know, you know, I, I was envisioning the day when we would create like little business cards and be like, do you have footage, you know, contact Berkeley Cop Watch and, you know, we'll remember. It takes a minute to, to enter that footage into the database. It doesn't happen immediately. And, um, and, you know, and we're, we're actually interested in changing the interface of the database so that it's more user friendly. So you don't see all these fields at one time, kind of, so that you kind of walk through the questions a little more kind of chronologically or, um, and, and, and we, and we have to keep in mind, like, yeah, the, if the database isn't going to work if people don't work it, you know, so we have to figure out a way to make it manageable. There are communities that have big, huge police forces. Yeah, maybe you want to just do a precinct. Maybe you just want to do a, a geographical area. You know, so so you you know again, this is a tool that has to fit into the the way that you do your work and what you have decided. You know how it helps you. But I I, I think it can be useful. But you with your group have to just come up with what the parameters of what you want to do are. And, you know, we, we have made some connections with the college here. And so we have a little class that we run. Um, and part of that work for us is trying to, you know, okay, now are we going to train volunteers on this database and have them clock some hours as interns to do some of the work that, um, that it's going to take to make this, this system work. I think we're all volunteers here. That's all, that's my my assumption. Um, other thoughts? What do you think? You know, um, there's a message from Andrew um, in the chat. Andrew, I don't know if you feel comfortable just um, speaking it speaking it aloud. My tongue hurts. <laughs> Okay, I'll read it. I'll read it. I, I've been thinking about having volunteers committing to database ingest shifts for those who don't feel comfortable being out in the street cop watching. Of course, this introduces the risk of miscommunication between the person who captured the incident versus the person ingesting. Yeah, I don't know, Stephanie, do you want to take them? Yeah, so, um, you know, if the person on the, on the street can fill out the, a, a form, like a paper copy maybe, of like the important information and write up just a brief, you know, a couple of sentences about what they saw. So time, date, location, officers present. And then, yeah, those volunteers can do the work of answering that information in. I think that's, that's definitely a way to engage people who might not want to be out on the streets. Yeah. The other thing we have in, our, in this database, which we didn't show, but there's two different incident forms. There's one that's like a minimal form, and then there's like the cataloger form. So like the minimal form doesn't have the tags, for instance, because that's something that somebody can go in later and elaborate on, or it's the key information about like who you are, which officers are there, what happened, um, can be entered by somebody who was actually there and then filled out later. Yeah. Oh, Jocelyn, okay. I'm interested in viewing all of this with the impact of COVID especially with regards to officer practices. Yeah, what have you been noticing in your community? Well, specifically um, with that comment, I was looking at the work that this integration of organizing their data would be on our office practice, um, Portland Cop Watch office. Um, our county is in a phase one lockdown mode. Um, we personally practice uh, a very safe model for our risks with regards to how many people we can have in our office space at one time. Uh, we have cleaning measures in between. So we're kind of, um, for us, we're very much in a operating um, 
with high risk scenarios with respect to our personal protection. So we're, I'm just kind of interested um, in, with the lens of COVID, you know, the amount of work that people are doing with a, this being an offsite um, data collection. And I'm just kind of maybe interested in how um, other people are addressing this because we have uh, currently a limit of approximately two people at a time in our office space because it's so small. Dan does a significant amount of cleaning and that takes a lot of, a lot of time. Um, this is basically tripled the time it takes us to do tasks that um, were yeah. easier to do before. Thank you. Yeah, we're definitely dealing with the same situation here. Um, we have a very small office, you know, we try to keep the window open, keep, that's why I've got this mask on. Sorry, you can't see my face. Um, <laughs> and yeah, like, um, you know, certain people are, are deciding not to come to the office at this time. And um, so thinking about your personal archive of footage and how you're going to share that with the group is super important. And so we've, we've kind of been doing this thing where we send to our email address the information we want uploaded into the database. And then we're going to get to those as they come and as we store them in like a, an email folder. But yeah, it's really tough. So, you know, if you are comfortable with spreadsheets, you might think about organizing that for yourself on your personal computer or cell phone. Um, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. Yeah. So we um, were thinking about, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say Mariah, Mariah said a way to handle that without introducing a number of other search fields to your database is a search conducted by date. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you simply want to be able to find the date of your footage again, that's a way to do it. I was responding to what I thought was the question, which was tracking uh, police incidences during during this outbreak, the way they're responding differently in situations, what they're doing. And so, you know, instead of creating a whole new data field, like a checkbox for like during COVID or, you know, whatever, you use the existing data to track, you know, maybe by date or, you know, and this could apply to a lot of different situations. Mm. Yeah, and definitely in, in FileMaker, you can do a search by range of dates, which is, you know, one of the strengths of using something like a database app versus like a, a spreadsheet, for instance. So what do y'all think? Is this, is this something that you might, you might consider, you know, does it seem, does it seem too complicated? Does it seem, you know, to me, does it, is it in the ballpark of what you need? It's in the ballpark of what we need, and it is complicated. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, uh, what we were talking about was whether or not to um, try to have a, a follow-up in July and to say, well, what if, what if, like, if folks are really like, uh, like, damn, we want a system like that. We want to get started with that. Um, you know, I guess it just starts with, with kind of making that decision and that we're committed. We want to work with you to make it happen. Um, and, and so the, the requirements, you know, do you, do you have access to, I think we're saying an Apple computer, uh, computer is better for running FileMaker Pro. Um, you know, and, and if you were to get, you know, do you need financial help to get started with that? Um, what kind of, what are the obstacles? Do you have volunteers? Like, what is it, what is it that makes you hesitate or, or does it, does it excite you and make you go, wow, you know, I really want to get with this because again, we, you know, we're willing to, to follow through and to cycle back and to try to, try to support you as, as you try to implement. And we know it's, we know it's not, it's not super easy, but I think it'll be easier 
All right. Need it as a mobile app. That's interesting. Um, wow. Huh? Um, go ahead. Um, our nonprofit keeps us busy and we would need to get a grant to be able to spend more time with this, but we would love to start the database from the Desto grade. Um, awesome. Anna, what do you think out there? What do you, <laughs> what do you think about Fresno? What, you guys ready? <laughs> yes. So we've definitely been in different situations where, we didn't even use specific details in documenting um, like witnesses. And I can just think of a couple times where this would have just been so helpful for us and definitely organizing information. And um, so we're actually planning, now it's a bigger group of us um, for our cop watch training, hopefully in August or July. Um, and it seems like now we got the space and, um, it's definitely needed out here um, in the Central Valley, but in Fresno. And so, yeah, I, I definitely see myself and um, I'm going to be uh, updating more people on the webinar today because they wanted to know and they couldn't um, join. But um, yeah, I, I look forward to trying to see how we can fit that over here in Fresno. Yes. Yeah, um, that's great. That's great. Um, Anybody else? What do y'all think? I see Dennis is saying El Grito is down. Um, cool. So what, again, what we're saying is that we're going to send you out a little hundred <laughs> percent, right? On. Um, we're going to send you out a survey and we're going to, Yvonne's going to think about what times, you know, we're going to try to figure out when would be a good time for a follow-up. And I guess what we're hoping is that, again, we're going to send you these resources today but, but for you to really check out those materials and write down what questions you have. If we were to reconvene, you know, what, you know, when you look at the user guide, for example, um, you know, what questions does it come up? And maybe we could prepare for something in, in July where you're sitting there, you know, did you get FileMaker Pro on your computer? And are you ready to like start customizing and, you know, but, but it's good to poke around those resources and kind of understand, to just, just to help you come up with good questions. All right. Yeah, Angela. and thinking, thinking about um, the different issues that you guys are working on and how you want to be able to track those. Um, and I feel committed to helping people figure out, you know, maybe FileMaker Pro isn't for them, but figuring out what works for you. Other thoughts, other comments? Things that we should keep in mind? He says capacity is the main concern. Having the structure for the database would be great, even if it's just for the spreadsheet. But the cost is another concern, especially as computers age and if FileMaker needs to be upgraded later. That's absolutely true. You know, will, you know, if folks, if, if money, you know, if, if, if finances are keeping you from doing this, we're not wealthy. We, we're all volunteers as well. But, you know, I'll, we'll shake the money tree. We'll, we'll put it on our Facebook. We'll try to help get the money and to get you, get you set up. Because that's, that's our number one. I mean, come on now. We've worked on this for a couple of years. We, we definitely want to see it work. <laughs> we definitely want you to try it. <laughs> Uh, for me, Andrea, as you know, I need to get people more involved in really starting up a, a robust cop watch and something definitely once that's going that I would definitely, I think it's great. I've worked with FileMaker Pro. I'm also a database developer. I know there's a lot of different options. It's a very hard decision. I understand FileMaker Pro is very simple on the back end, front end. So Good. I understand um, that you, you know, went probably through a lot of decision-making and how you came upon that. And um, 
I think it's great what you've done. I don't, for me, when I look at it, especially the data, database map, I don't see that it's complicated. It makes sense. I, I'm ex I was surprised it wasn't more complicated though. Um, yeah, so, so I look forward hoping to use it. Um, it would probably not be for several months though, probably not be in the July timeframe. Mm -hmm. You know, Can I add something? Go ahead. Just that it's really great to see that there are database developers in this CopWatch community because I just be clear, I am not a database developer. I'm an archivist. I just kind of know how to use FileMaker. Um, and, you know, it's been a learning process for me too. So I am not at all like a trained professional like database developer at all. Just so. <laughs> well, if you ever have any questions, I mean, it's been about years or more that I've used it. No, actually, it's been about 18 years. <laughs> it was in 2000 that I, 2002. But um, if you ever, I, I do have an understanding of databases. If you have any, any questions, please get your phone, please get my phone number. And I, and, you know, especially the database uh, flow, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to help you think things through if you need it. I'm sure you'd be horrified by some of the scripts that I wrote. So <laughs> it's really. <laughs> so uh, Anna says, how can we check out the slides that were presented today? And well, we can, we can send that stuff to you. We can send a copy. Cause like I said, I've got everybody's address. Um, yeah. With the registration and information. So we're going to send you a follow-up. Um, and we just have to stay in, in communication about what it's going to take to make this happen. We are looking again, if you know any designers, we are trying to revamp the user interface, um, like as to make it simpler. So if, if anybody's got connections that way. The other thing I want to say is that it's my experience that some people, all they want to do is cop watch. They just want to be out there and be on the street and they come back to the office. They're like, nah, you know, nah. other people are much more, they're like, eh, this cops kind of freak me out or I'm on probation or parole or whatever. I can't get over there. So there are different roles that we can play within CopWatch that, that can very much complement each other. Um, so just, just to put that out there. And the, the other thing is that if you were just going through the newspaper and entering information that you learn about officers just from what's going on in your town and just keeping that just aggregating that that's again that's the beginning the other thing that we did is we wrote california public records acts to the police department saying well we'd like to get a copy of your 2008 roster and and be entering those officers you know just from that just so at least you know who you're dealing with um but yeah so there's a lot of a lot of admin -y kind of work. There's enough for everyone. So, <laughs> um, anyway, I'm sorry. Was somebody else going to say something to somebody else? Um, great. Well, um, I guess what we're going to do, if nobody has anything else that they want to share, I guess what we would do is just go ahead and um, I'll take some more. Mac users can save the chat with the three dots in the chat field. Um, yeah, and we can also, I think we also can send it. Um, so I, I think I, I invite your closing comments. Anything else you want to add before we Go on about our days. It's a lot to think about, huh? You know? Yeah, well, uh, just just generally, you, you open by talking about the time that we're in. And I've been saying to people, I've never heard um, late night talk show hosts or news media people talking about the word solidarity or racism or police brutality in the way they're talking about it now. The um, movie theater up the street from our office has Black Lives Matter on the marquee. There's people marching in the streets every day here in Portland. We had uh, a big budget fight on Wednesday where um, some, some of our police budget got cut. 
I've just never seen anything like this in doing this for almost 30 years. So I'm just very – I'm optimistic at the same time I know that our government is going to try to pull a fast one on us. But uh, at least I have some optimism around this movement. Uh -huh. Well, this is a, you know, it is a good time right now in, you know, in your locality to raise money and to get volunteers, you know, that that's up for people. And so this is a project that could actually help to focus, you know, and anchor your group, you know, because volunteers want to feel useful. They want to feel like they're doing something, like they actually have ownership, you know, in this project. And um, I feel like it's actually a good way to engage folks. Um, but uh, it's a, it's a great way to be an ally, um, I think. Uh, Yvonne or Stephanie, do you have anything you'd like to close with? I just want to thank you all for, for being here and, and there's been such good discussion and great discussion in the chat. And I really am looking forward to connecting more with you guys. Um, it's so cool to just have connections between cop watches in their local communities. And I'm really excited about that. Yeah, I, the only thing I would also just add is my appreciation for everybody who um, came today and contributing to the conversation. And yeah, really nice to meet you all. Yeah, and for your commitment to the work you're doing in your community, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and so spread the word. And um, for anyway, for those of you who may have heard, we were trying to have a Copwatch conference because again, we're we're celebrating our 30th year. Uh, Dan, we'll give maybe two years. We'll we'll go to Dan's, go to Portland Copwatch's 30th anniversary. Um, but we thought maybe instead of spending money to bring us all physically together in this very difficult time, that it might make more more sense for us to try to maybe come together on different topics and invite and kind of create kind of a more of a national cop watch network um, and get in touch and, and, and just talk about the campaigns that we're engaged in and learn from each other. Cause I know everybody on here is, um, you know, you've got your own situation to handle. So I think there's a lot to learn from each other as well. So um, let's stay in conversation. And um, I guess that's it. Have a great day y'all. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everyone. And you're welcome, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Bye. Thank you. All right. Take care.